Good morning. And welcome to the Schools and Nursery Show, day two. Um, 12 o'clock this morning, and we have the first of our panel discussions. My name is Fiona Cottom. I'm the principal at Heartland International School. And thankfully, you won't be hearing too much from me today because I'm joined throughout the morning and afternoon by a group of expert panelists from a range of schools across the city, each of whom sometimes represents either a different curriculum or a different model or a different phase, but each of whom will give you insights to some of the pertinent questions that parents ask. For those of you who are in the arena who are joining us physically here, a warm welcome. To those of us who are joining us either on the YouTube channel or through the live stream that will be available in the weeks ahead, a warm welcome to you also. This morning's first session, I'm delighted to be joined by Lee Hole, who is the principal of Dubai British School, Timothy Roberts, who is the school principal at Raffles World Academy, um, Alex Kirkpatrick, who is the head of primary at that's Raffles as well, isn't it? It is Raffles as well. Good, thank you. And Colin Gary, who's the principal at Uptown International School. Now, to, to start things off this morning, we've got a sort of a heavy topic, but, but one that parents are always interested in, and that is when we talk about measuring performance and we talk about the performance of students, one of the questions is how do we do that? How do schools actually measure the performance of students and teachers to make sure that teachers are delivering the best they possibly can? And ultimately, how do we actually communicate that to parents? So lots of questions there, both around reporting, recording, assessment, um, basic school reports, but also our quality assurance measures in school. I'm hoping that just by talking for a little bit and posing that question, I've given this panel food for thought. Uh, I, I try to surprise them and I'll bounce around so it isn't always coming from the first end and Colin isn't always going to be the first person that I pounce on. But I am going to begin with you, Colin. Um, big question, big debate, open discussion. Go for us. Just your thoughts generally. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I think um, the first thing to, to stipulate is that it's important to understand what curriculum your child is in, uh, because the reporting between the different uh, curriculums will be very different. So for example, in the International Baccalaureate, we are grading from one to seven, which is very consistent all the way through as a continuum school. So first of all, you need to understand um, how the gradings are done, um, what the assessments look like, but what, regardless of the curriculum, there's gonna be some formative assessment holistically by the school teachers. And then there's gonna be some summative assessment that will be done by tests. And it depends on what age your child is as to how that looks. The important thing for me is that as a parent, you understand the curriculum, you understand the reporting, and most important of all, that when the reporting takes place, that you understand it. And if there's any concerns that you have about that, then you enter dialogue with the school to find out that you know where your child is in their learning. From an IB perspective, there are four criterion, all very different, ranging from real, real life context to knowledge and understanding. And as a parent, you would look at that and see where the strengths and areas for development are for your child. Lee, I know you're just about to open a new school, um, but you come with that you know, range of history from both different curriculums and different models. Talk to us about maybe even the same question, but how are you going to set that up in a new environment? Yeah, I think um, one of the most important things for me when speaking to parents is that progress of, of young people is almost never linear. So we, all, we, we seem to get caught up into a mindset of because my child is here now, they'll be there after this amount of time, then there, and then there. And that's very rarely the case with a young person. Um, we're at DBS Jumeirah, we, we're very much focused on the development of the young person. And that looks very different um, for each individual. Um, and you also need to think about as parents the, the various different amounts of data that are out there for you whether that is whether that data is actually for a parent's consumption or whether it is for something else. So very often I, I will I'll hear parents talking about some of the standardized testing or some of the some of the other stuff that's done out there in, as re, in regards to assessment. That's not really there as for consumption of parents. Um, very often that's help, that's there to to help guide the school, to guide the teacher, to give the teacher really good information about the young person, so that learning can be planned for them to continue to grow. 
And the other thing I will say is there are different ways in which your child might be reported on. Um, and you need to be aware of that when you're looking at different schools as well. Some schools may rank and file children, and you might get a, a percentile based on their cohort. Other schools might use a curriculum standards approach. So they'll tell you a list of things that your child is either working towards doing, capable of doing, or even working beyond um, in an MYP sit setting or a DP setting. That's very much a standards-based. So it's, it's looking at those curriculum standards in that way. Um, and I think the, the best advice I could give to any parent is speak to your school. Um, engage with your school when they offer parent workshops. Um, ask questions, speak to your teacher. And if you're ever unsure about anything that's being reported on or information you're getting about your child, just ask lots of questions. Um, because I don't know of any school leader or any teacher that would be impatient with a parent that wants to know more about the information that's coming to them about their child. Tim, uh you know, thoughts from you to expand on that. You know, this is a, a dynamic market and, and we're very responsive to the customer, as it were. Um, parents are very engaged and involved in terms of how we operate as schools. And, and that information is, is a powerful piece of information for us to share with parents. Maybe just talk about your experience of that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think in Dubai and in, in fact all other school systems, you'll have formal reporting processes which tell you what the child knows, understands, and can do at a given point in time. But then the next step is to, as we've already said, have a dialogue with the teachers, which is often in terms of parent-teacher conferences or what we used to call parents' evenings, where you can come in, you can discuss the report, see where they are, and try and figure out the next steps. And then a the teacher should then also be able to tell you how they're going to use the data to personalize the learning for every child. It's very well telling a child where they are at a given point in time, what you really want to know is how they're going to kick on to go to the next level, the next stage in their learning. And I think that continual dialogue is very, very important. And it's not just at the formal reporting points I want to point out as well. If teachers and parents are talking quite frequently, even at pick up and drop off of school, they'll quite often get little ideas of where their child is and what they can do just to help them as they're going along. So that dialogue needs to be continuous, not just at these finite reporting points, I think. Alex, it's always, always difficult to be person number four on a panel when we've had three experts who've shared a tremendous amount of information, but I'm sure you've got something extra to add to this. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty tricky to think of anything extra, but like they've all said, being open, transparent with parents is something that's really key for us. Uh, as Tim alluded to there, something that we do at Raffles is drop off, pick up, we're there, we talk to parents. Our doors are always open as leadership as well, so we can talk to them. And being British curriculum as well, we've got those curriculum standards in place that are quite open and clear for parents and teachers to know, right, your, your child has met these standards, so the next things we're going to be working on are these. And as a parent, this is how you can help them. And, and giving parents resources and tools that will help to, I suppose, understand what's coming next in the curriculum is key. So, so in fairness to you, I'll, I'll start at your end first then with the next question. It doesn't give you as much thinking time, but at least you get in there first with your answers. Um, part of the question initially was about, you know, how do schools quality assure the quality of teaching in schools to reassure parents? Not, not that we're trying to get rid of people. I don't mean it from that perspective. But, you know, what systems and processes explaining to parents? What do we put in place all of the time? to make sure that standards are the best so that we can reassure our clients? Yeah, um, I think education is no different to a, a lot of other business sectors in the sense of we, we have a, a formalized like appraisal system, performance management system, which feeds into this. And as part of it, again, we, we have an open door policy within the school for, for everyone, for, for school and teachers as well. So teachers go in, they do observations of each other, SL or senior leaders will go in, do formal observations of teachers. Uh, regularly, at least two or three times a term, we'll be popping in and out. We'll be having those dialogue, those professional conversations with teachers. They'll come to us, ask for some support and guidance in terms of how can they better improve their teaching standards. Um, in terms of um, looking at the work that students are producing as well, that takes place in looking at the books and looking at the work that's produced there from students, from teachers. The dialogue that takes place in there as well is very informative for students and parents as well. So it's a case of it's an ongoing cycle where we as leaders, all the way through to middle leaders, right down to classroom practitioners, we're, we're supporting each other to move and improve the standards forwards. 
Tim, one of the, the challenges that we face as school leaders sometimes is that a parent will come to us and, and they might complain about the quality of teaching or the provision they believe their child is getting. And sometimes that's just because of a lack of understanding, a new curriculum, a new environment. Uh, perhaps, you know, just that reassurance for parents about how we manage processes like that and how that door is open in terms of listening to them. Yeah, again, it comes down to the open door policies that schools need to have. You want to be communicating with the parents so that they can feel assured and have a trust in the school that when things are going well, you're telling the parents they're going well, but also that you're taking the feedback from the parents which you've got to listen to and act upon. And also you've got to have the body of evidence. The formal appraisal systems are fine because that builds up your body of evidence. But often you can get anecdotal conversations going with parents and then find out, well, there's something anomalous here. What you've got to bear in mind is that Teaching is a human profession, and from time to time, a given teacher and a given child might encounter some difficulties. That's perfectly okay. That can happen. It's what you do to resolve them over the fullness of time. And only en enable that by talking to each other and having the trust that the school want the best for their child. Because all the parents want the best for the child, and the school does as well. So as long as you're working together on that pathway, generally you can resolve most issues, I think. Lee, yesterday morning, KHDA... Um put up a, a post to say that the ratings for schools uh, were now in a sort of a public domain on their website. And they do make judgments on the quality of teaching. How does that both support schools or indeed sometimes causes us even greater challenges in terms of that overarching statement and judgment that's made about what happens in a school? Um, I think KHDA serve a purpose in this country of, of holding us accountable as school leaders for the quality of provision that we have in our school. Their role when they come in to inspect us is to inspect. They hold up the mirror to our school and say, this is where we see you at the moment in, in regards to your quality. Prior to their arrival, schools have to do a self-evaluation. And they have to say, this is where we see ourselves. This is what we think we are in, in all of these different key areas. Uh, I'm getting a musical, uh, uh, musical Lee, accompaniment Lee here. I'm not used to that. Maybe I should burst into song. and his band over in the corner, <laughs> so I do apologise. We're just going to have to shout and be a yeah, bit more rock fine, and roll, I think, Lee, go for <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, well, I won't be singing. Um, one of the dangers that we have as, as school leaders sometimes is to slip into something called um, performativity. Performativity is when you set a standard for a bunch of teachers and you tell them that they have to um, teach in a certain way or they have to tick certain boxes. It's one of my, it, it makes my stomach turn whenever I hear people saying box ticking. Um, what we should be doing as school leaders in, in, in schools is we should be working with our teachers every day to help them to think about the way that they're designing learning so that they are constantly interrogating their practice and trying to be better. We can have, if we just mirror what KHDA does every time we go into a classroom and we judge our teachers, all we're going to have is teachers constantly trying to uh, jump through hoops and perform for us. So one of the things that I'm quite passionate about and, and maybe a little bit controversial at, at times is I, I want to steer away from doing observations of teachers. Um, and what, what we concentrate on doing is going into classrooms, seeing what is happening from our perspective as leaders, and then having them tell us what they were trying to achieve when they were teaching that lesson, whether they felt that they, they did that, and then helping them with their thinking as they try to improve. I think it's interesting, KHDA have got a stand here this, this year at, at the exhibition. And that's a really powerful message as well about how we work in collaboration with the KHDA, whilst they certainly do hold us to account, and quite rightly so. There's very much a collaborative process that is there to support parents as well, should they have those questions. Um, but it's not just the KHDA, is it, in terms of inspection? Colin, you're an IB school and you're also held to account by other accrediting systems that make judgments about qualities of teaching and learning. I wonder if you might explain that to parents so they understand. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, yes, as an IB school, we have an evaluation uh, internationally, globally, every five years, where obviously, from a KHDA perspective, it's on an annual basis. Um, what's quite interesting, though, is that when you do marry up the expectations of IB, and the expectations of KHDA, and look at the two uh, grids, you'll find that essentially they're almost the same. Um, and, and we've often done uh, that exercise with staff where we've looked at what constitutes outstanding teaching and learning from an IB perspective, uh, and then looked at it from the KHDA framework. And um, so that's, yes, you are um, 
there, there are two masters there, IB and KHDA, but that's something that, you know, just as colleagues across the panel have said, it's about support and challenge. Uh, and um, quite rightly, parents in Dubai have high expectations for their children, and we would support that. And um, there's that triangulation that you'd expect in the best schools in the world, which is the observations in whatever form, as Lee says, where are formal, informal learning walks, the quantitative data, which is what's the statistics that are coming out of those children in the classroom, and then the feedback, third part of the triangle, the feedback that's coming back from the parents, the staff, and the students themselves. So I think when it comes to quality of teaching, what you as parents need to be assured about is that you know, through the regulators, certainly, through an annual inspection system, and through all the systems that we have in our schools, um, we are holding our teachers to account. So be assured, um, if there are questions there, um, as, as colleagues were saying, the door is open, come and have a discussion. However, I'm going to call and I'm going to stay with you because something you said in your previous answer to the previous question just reminded me that the one thing we're very guilty of in schools and very bad about doing is we use jargon all the time. And you talked about uh, uh, different types of assessment. You talked about summative assessment and formative assessment. Now, I can see the nods here. We know what you mean. But there might be many parents at home for whom school, this is the first time they're coming into these contexts, or indeed their first child coming to school. Talk to us about assessment. What does it look like in schools? And what do you mean by formative and summative assessment? Yeah, um, I think uh, two examples I'll give. Uh, the first one is that quite understandably in the Dubai context, there is a focus on core subjects like maths, English, and science. So there's an expectation by standardized assessments um, with, with, that often can take the the uh, form of GL assessments um, that um, have a, a UK-based company, and those have a gold standard about where children are in their learning. And those essentially are summative, meaning traditional tests, where the children are asked, uh, in, in that particular example, uh, with online assessments where there are right and wrong answers. And that would be deemed to be summative assessment. Formative assessment, Tend, it can take various forms, but it's about, like Lee had said at an earlier stage, that progress of the young child, where are they in their learning, and his, holistically across their curriculum, where are they making progress, and how do you know that as a teacher, and how can you form the next steps for that child in different formats? I'm going to keep us on the sort of formative assessment discussion, Lee, uh, but moving on thinking about what are the other things that schools are trying to develop ways to assess not to put things in boxes and to tick boxes but when we're talking about skill development when we're talking about inquiry-based learning when we're talking about development of character um, how do we reassure parents and how do we make parents aware of those softer pieces of the curriculum that are per perhaps even more important yeah i think um in my experience the experts on formative assessment and looking at those soft skills are EYFS teachers. They're, they're, they're unbelievable at just walking around a classroom and observing a bunch of three-year-olds playing, which sometimes for someone like me can look like herding cats. And they're just constantly aware of what's happening in that classroom. They'll see two children maybe have a, a, a fallout over a toy that they're playing with and they'll be in instantly because they'll see that there's some dysregulation in the relationship there and they'll go in, that's a formative assessment. They've seen two young people falling, up, falling out over a toy. They've instantly done a formative assessment and they will intervene in that moment and have those young people talk about how they might be able to play with that toy, share that toy um, and move forward. That's a soft skill development. That's developing a collaborative skill in a young person, the ability to say, I want to play with that, you've got it. How am I gonna navigate that moment? For a three-year-old, that is a, a huge milestone. That teacher has recognized that through some formative assessment that they've observed, and then they've intervened with some teaching or some sort of intervention um, that's helped that young person get over that hill. So that for me is a, is a really is, is when schools like, like our schools are so successful, it's very often because the EYFS area is, is exceptional. And I think the other thing to reassure parents is that sometimes not all assessment has a number and a label attached to it. It's done in different ways. 
How else, Tim, you know, do schools communicate that type of progress and where their children are on the learning journey to parents? How, how do you do it in your school? I think there's a variety of ways. Essentially, what you want to be able to do is have children showcase their talents on occasion. So it could be as simple as getting parents to come in and watch the school play, and then they'll get an idea of how they developed and growing. Debating is another excellent way parents can actually see their communication skills moving hand in hand. We have science fairs that go on where they can actually demonstrate what's happening. So the parents can actually see them doing a science experiment and explaining your know, method, results, conclusions. So they're talking about the scientific method as they're moving through, for example. So they can actually join them on their journey of education. I think if the parents are engaged and involved and actually see where their children are on the journey and the children are able to explain it to them or enunciate where they are in their learning, then it often creates assurance within parents. I think the bit that sometimes goes wrong, just to expand about the summative assessments, whether it's the British curriculum or the IB curriculum, at age 16 and 18, the kids do sit down and do summative examinations. And that, they're very, very critical times where parents need to be engaged and supportive. At age 16, that will often discuss what pathways the child's going to take in their post-16 education. And at age 18, that then starts to inform university choice. So then you bring in the whole notion of careers counselling and start to bring that down into the school. So the way the world works at the moment, the children at some point, rightly or wrongly, but it's the world we live in, will get weighed and measured, for want of a better word. And that will then dictate the pathway that can go on. What you've really got to be engaging with the school is to make sure that the pathway is there for your child. We don't want to be pushing children down the wrong pathway. It's got to be the right pathway for them that will enable them to develop and grow over time. And we're just coming up to that really important exam period, aren't we, where everybody gets stressed and anxious and we try to support the children. But Alex, as a parent, what should I expect from the school, for example, throughout the year in terms of formal reporting? Do I just get one report at the end of the year? Or, you know, how does it work? How do you keep me practically informed? Yeah, um, each school will have their own different ways of doing it. But if I just talk about our school, one of the things that I brought in this year was quite early on in September, we had what's called a, a settling in report, which is a, a holistic pastoral report that will inform parents in written against a load of statements that we put together to see how the child has settled into school. And this comes all the way from FS1 to so age three, all the way up to uh, year six. And then at the end of the term, there'll be a formal written report against curriculum statements. Prior to that, there will have also been a parent-teacher conference meeting as well that's taken place where they've opportunities to discuss those. And then in term two and term three, we follow a similar pattern where we have parent-teacher conferences where parents can come in, talk to the teachers, all the teachers, not just homeroom teachers who are teaching English, math, science. They can talk to the Arabic, the PE, um, the art teacher. And then they will get a, a formal report at the end of the term, which gives them, um, I suppose, a, a grading against the curriculum standards. I'm conscious that we, we don't have as many people perhaps on, on the ground this morning as we have done in some of the other talks. But from those few people who are here, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot or embarrass you, are there any particular questions at this time? Feel free to raise your hand. Mm, that's OK. We're all very quiet down the front. Um, Final thoughts, I think, Colin. I'll begin with you. Just, just your final personal thoughts, perhaps on anything that we haven't touched upon that you believe is really pertinent. Um, yesterday, just to give you an idea, we talked about um, you know, the impact that AI is going to have on reporting. We talked about technology and its impact. We also talked about changing exam systems and the, the changing nature of education. But any final thoughts that you might share with parents about that reassurance point about how schools are doing our jobs and how we will continue to do our jobs despite the challenges and changes in the world. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. I think uh, my parting words would be about um, advice to parents is ensure that you know your child. I know you know your child, but know where you're, there should be no surprises. Know where your child is on the journey. Quite often we as educators are involved in long conversations that sometimes can come as a surprise. So I think that all schools are pretty good at communicating that information, whether it be termly reports or um, communication by email, etc. But what I would say is that 
don't be afraid, be confident to be in schools. There's been colleagues across the panel making comments about pick up and drop off and such like. Those next steps are really important in understanding that, you know, uh, K-12 approach of three to 18. Where is your child? What do they need to, to work on and develop? Um, and, and, and be aware of, 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 of what their next steps are. Uh, Lee, final thoughts from you. Um, it's almost become a cliche now that we, we say that children are worth more than the number that, that they get from their exam. And it's, it's kind of common knowledge now that we don't judge students by the numbers that they get in their exams. Um, and that's become no less true than it, than it ever has been. Um, but I would encourage you as parents to, to kind of see beyond that in the schools as well. Um, because the more we demand schools to have high average scores on uh, various different assessments, the more pressure schools feel then with regards to their admissions uh, and the students that they're bringing in. Um, schools are so much more than the exam results that they publish every year. Um, and all of the schools that are on this uh, panel today, including Fiona's school, uh, are so much more than the exam results that they get. And they're amazing places. And I think Dubai actually is a wonderful city now when it comes to parental choice for, for schools. So it's almost impossible to get it wrong nowadays. Tim, final thoughts from you or words of wisdom? Yeah. I would suggest as parents you keep listening to your child and listening to the school. By listening, I mean that when your child's small, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They'll come home from school and they'll tell you everything they've done at school and they're all happy and chirpy and you think everything's fine. Once they turn into teenagers, that will probably descend into a grunt or an okay. And oddly enough, at that time, parents tend to distance themselves from school. And as the gentleman at the end said, sometimes then you get a shock. You may think your child is on the pathway to be doing amazingly well at maths, but your child actually isn't doing terribly well at maths and the school have been endeavoring to tell you but you've not read the report, so you've not been along to the parents' evening, or you've not spoken to a teacher at pick up and drop off, and then suddenly you're faced with, oh, the maths isn't going as well as I thought it was. Whereas if you step back in time and communicate with the child and communicate with the school, you can usually solve most of these difficulties and get the children back on track again. Thank you for that, yeah, really important. Really important points there. Alex, final, final thoughts from you? I think most of the things I was going to say have been covered, but from a parent myself, knowing you know your children, if something doesn't seem right, you need to go and speak to the school. Because it could be if your child's coming home and suddenly has gone quiet, then maybe they're not happy. And it could be a friendship problem, or it could actually be an academic problem, and, and suddenly they're struggling themselves, and they don't know how to say, oh, I used to be able to do this, and now the gap's getting bigger, and things like that. So you know your children communicate with the school, have that dialogue, that two-way conversation, and work with the school, and the school will work with you. Um, th there are huge tangents of conversation that have happened this morning, um, but I think we're all on the same page. Schools will obviously keep parents informed. Schools will obviously ensure that quality assurance measures are in place in schools so that we deliver the highest quality. The regulator will continue to challenge us to make sure that we're doing that. But I think some of the most important points have just come out at the end there, which is about that communication piece with parents and the responsibility that parents have to stay engaged, as Tim said, with schools to make sure that there are no unhidden messages when they suddenly arrive later on. Um, you have been privileged to listen to these four school leaders this morning share some of their thoughts and their insights. They are all here over the course of today on the variety of school stands. Please do go along and speak to them. My thanks to Alex, to Timothy, to Lee and to Colin. Um, different curriculums, different stands all around the school. Please do make sure that you touch base with them on your journey today. Uh, so on behalf of the Schools and Nurseries Show, a huge thank you to our panel for our first discussion of the morning. Our second panel discussion will begin in about 15 minutes time. And it's the question that we all have the same answer to, but every year it's one of the most important topics, which curriculum? Um, so we all share the same view, which is why we've all giggled and laughed at that one but an important one for you as parents, I know, to ask. So join us again in about 15 minutes' time for our next panel discussion of the morning. Thank you.